All right, so this is uh, our lecture on topic 12, everybody, speciation and extinction. So we talked about what a species is. Most of you know that. Speciation is when we get a new species. All right. Geography has a big impact, okay? There are two modes here. Let's break these words down. Alleopatric and sympatric, okay? Anybody know what the Patrick means there? I'll give you a hint. It's not the SpongeBob kind of Patrick. What do you call your grandparents on your dad's side? Paternal, okay? So this is like the, the, the father, okay? Um, it literally means like fatherland, like you hear, you know, talked about in some old German, you know, movies and things like that. So alio and sim okay what do you think those mean sim means similar same Phys yes a separation okay yes okay so alio means separated okay like what do you pay when you break up with your spouse alimony separated money Okay, so sim, or excuse me, <clears throat> sim means um, together. So if you can remember what those, the roots mean, people who, people who learn word roots and can break down new words tend to be very academically successful, okay? All right, so let's talk about the difference between these two. Alio means separated by a physical barrier, barrier, okay? So the parent population is separated, okay? So this would be like your finches. This would be like things that made it to Hawaii, okay? This would be like the two sides of the Grand Canyon. That's Alleopatric, okay? So when these populations become geographically isolated through islands or through, you know, think about a continent breakup, okay? Remember when all the continents used to be Pangea? That's like, this can happen in many different ways. But anytime we prevent gene flow, we're going to see this happen. Now we might not always see a new species, but so this can be due to natural disasters, but think of like just the cartoony Ice Age movies, right? Where, remember the comp? Yes. Okay. I know that's not realistic, but it helps us visualize it. All right. Sympatric. This is a species that they're still together, okay? They're still in the same region. This usually happens to some sort of new niche showing up. Does everybody know what a niche is? It's something in the environment that allows creatures to like take advantage of energy, breeding space, protective space, okay? Like if a tree falls over in the forest, that's a new niche. Like bugs can live underneath of it, bacteria. and uh, um, There's all kinds of niches out there. Like a new cave system is a niche, okay? Have you heard of the cave fish with no eyes? Yeah, so they had an ancestor that had eyes, but when they entered that new niche, the eyes became useless, so they just stopped. forming in that population it takes a lot of calories to make eyes so over thousands of generations eyes vanish from that population
there's a lot of science fiction out there that like would if humans could like if humans didn't need to speak anymore would we lose the ability for higher thinking planet of the apes and stuff like that where the apes speak and the humans are all right how many generations would it take for us to lose our big brains after teaching for a while I really never mind all right so here's a little graphic that that sort of um, demonstrates this okay both of them start off as just one little green circle here and then in Alleopatric, we have a barrier. In Sympatric, we have polymorphism. There's a new form of the species, okay? Um, so what happens here is we see a totally new species evolve on both sides of the circle down here on the third row. And within the population, we see a sort of, I don't want to call it a subpopulation because it's technically two distinct species but the subspecies and so you will see a new distinct species and if you put them back together you will not see interbreeding okay everybody understand this it's pretty pretty easy stuff um, so speciation happens due to reproductive isolation okay reproductive isolation and that can happen through a couple ways okay pre-zygotic barriers okay everybody know what a zygote is what's the equation for a zygote Sperm plus egg equals zygote, okay? So, pre-zygotic barriers would mean like we can't get the sperm and egg together, okay? There's like a lot of ways that could happen, okay? You could have animals that just aren't the right behavior, okay? Maybe they were together, and now that they're separated, the males don't do the mating, whatever, okay? You could have animals that mate in different seasons, okay? Like mating season is in the fall for this species, and for whatever reason, it's now changed to the spring for the other species. So you just don't see mating. And a lot of animals are only fertile one time a year, okay? humans it's 12 times a year okay and, and a lot of animals aren't like that so they don't really worry about mating all the time we'll talk about those then there are post zygotic barriers okay this would mean some sort of reproductive act has happened but for whatever reason and that could be just incompatible chromosomes. It could be the babies are too big. It could be the babies are born sterile, like your your ligers. Do you have a question? Brian, quick. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Both of these, no matter which one they are, stop genes flowing between populations. Therefore, these things become reproductively isolated and that is what really really gives you your new species yes yes okay yeah, you are right. Okay, let's talk about those prezygotic barriers. I started going into some uh, uh, examples, but here we go. 
So for these prezygotic barriers, this means they don't even get a chance to, to, to engage in any kind of sexual act, okay? But don't, don't always think of it as like mammal sex. It could be plant pollen as well, okay? Um, it could be like, uh, you know, some fish and things, they don't really have a sexual act. Females lay unfertilized eggs, and then males inseminate the eggs outside of her body. So, like, there's lots of ways that nature gets sex achieved. So, prezygotic barriers. Let's go through these. Sorry. All right. We ready to talk about them? Or you? I see a lot of pencils moving. I'll kind of take a breath here. Okay. First one is habitat isolation. All right. This just means they live in different habitats, so they're not going to be mating. You have mountain bluebirds, and then you just have eastern bluebirds. They live in different places, so they never get the chance to fall in love. There's like a million ways this could happen, okay? A lot of these prezygotic barriers kind of give you a right place at the right time if you want to kind of jot this down. And this is obviously place when we're talking about right now. All right, temporal isolation, that's the right time, okay? So you see different species breeding at different times. Right place, right time. Here's two of them right here. Multiple ones can be in, in effect at the same time. Behavioral isolation. I've talked about this one where just some sort of mating behavior doesn't take place. A lot of animals have courtship rituals. Sort of like, I will not go to prom with you unless you have a big giant promposal. You cannot just send me a text. You have to have the right behavior. Right. This one's getting down to the nitty gritty here, but they call it mechanical isolation. This is when things just don't fit together. We picked something pretty tame for the example. There are sh snails that have shell shapes that prevent things like that. It doesn't always have to be genital based. A 
All right. Now this one, this is the closest one that's not successful, okay? There are different proteins on the surface of sperm and egg that sort of let them lock together, okay? If those proteins are incompatible, you never get a zygote. Now remember, in my example here, we have sperm and egg that are for these urchins here, they don't really move around too much and they release everything into the water but they're not going to fertilize because they are incompatible on sort of a subcellular level. So if we can't get your sperm and eggs to merge together, we don't get a zygote. Okay, so those are your five examples of uh, prezygotic barriers. Okay, let's take a second to just review those. All right, um, you don't have to deal with a partner because some of you don't have partners at home. Um, and we're going to do some group practice here. Which one would this be? That is right. Very good. What about this one? That is correct. In the wrong place. Behavioral, very good. All right, let's talk about some post-zygotic barriers, post-zygotic barriers. These ones are a little bit more technical, okay? You have to think a little bit more like a cellular bi biologist here. So this one, sperm and egg have met and we have some sort of zygote, but that zygote is going to have some issues. All right. So The key word for these are viab viability. Is it viable? You know, sheep and goat, goats are pretty genetically close to one another, but there's too many differences for the embryos to go through proper development. So although the sperm and egg can actually create a zygote, it cannot, it's just not genetically viable, okay? So that's a big common one there. This one is common because we, we mention this one a lot because we see the results of it. You would never even see the results of, of the um, um, hybrid viability. So there are animals that we can cross, but their offspring are always genetically sterile. A lot of times they're always the same sex too. can't remember if that's the case with mules, but my memory is telling me it is. Oh, 
Oh, they can be all. They can be um, male or female. All right. Hybrid breakdown. This is very common in the plant world and the agricultural world. world. There's a big sort of, um, you know, if you would go out and buy a bag of corn seed that you see all the farmers planting here when you're driving down the highway, it can be insanely expensive okay um you know hundreds of dollars for a big bag of it okay and it takes a lot of that to plant a big field and what the seed companies are doing are basically copywriting the genetics of the seeds and they are not genetically viable okay you might get one or two of them grow but they don't make seeds that are going to be um Well, reproductively viable is, I guess, the right word to say. So farmers have tried this with corn. They've tried it with cotton. Um, I don't think it works well with soybeans. And a lot of farmers illegally... You know, if I had a copy of a piece of software, am I allowed to just hand it out to all my friends, or is that illegal? That's illegal, right? Same thing if I go buy a CD and I'm like, I'll, I'll rip this CD and give everybody a copy. It's illegal to do that with seeds, too, because they are copyrighted genetics, okay? And so a lot of times farmers will try to, like, save some of the crop and use it for seeds, and it's illegal. And there's controversy. Huh? It shouldn't. Well, it shouldn't be. It should be. It's one of those bioethical debates where the seed company has spent lots and lots of money developing the hybrid, and they want to get their money back. And then a lot of people have your view where it's like he paid for it, it's his, he can do whatever he wants with it. I, I'm kind of in the middle because, I, you know, I want there to be hybrids that are very, very useful and, and, and able to feed more people or, or to be uh, use less pesticides or, or, or more uh, resistant to weather or whatever. But at the same time, you know, the farmers sometimes barely make a profit and one bad year can really wipe them out so it's i i'm i'm torn between the two views um there's there's some uh, really good documentaries out there on that sort of thing if you're bored over spring break and you want to watch something huh yeah monsanto is one of the companies that takes a lot of the uh punishment on it but there's others as well all right so take Take a look at your notes. We won't do this with a partner here in this remote situation. Just three types. Um, it says there's a practice FRQ in the packet. There is, but I'm not going to collect or grade that today. So don't worry about that. Uh, let's talk real quick about micro and macro evolution. Okay. All right. This, this will be a real quick one here. So speciation is really using these two concepts, okay? There's micro, which is small, and macro, which is big, okay? Our computers have macros where you can write a macro for the computer to do a whole bunch of steps. That way you don't have to do it manually every time, okay? So you can do that with your, write a macro. All right. So microevolution, all we're changing is allele frequencies, okay? And so if you're listening to this video, we have some music over our PA system we can't really do anything about. So microevolution is just Hardy-Weinberg type changes, okay? And that can be due to a lot of different things, okay? Um, natural selection, sexual selection, all those Hardy-Weinberg rules can create microevolution, those five conditions. 
macro are very large changes, okay? Branching out into a new trait, okay? Now, macro evolution can go into what's called stasis, where there's no changes over a very long period of time. You can think of this as something like horseshoe crabs. They have been the same forever, okay? I did my undergraduate research on horseshoe crabs. So they're kind of near and dear to me. When, what, near and dear? I don't know. Well, it wasn't random for me since I researched. Oh, why? Why? What? what their, why is their name? Oh, they they're horseshoe shaped. No, no, no. I know, but why did you choose those to research? Well, when I went to my field research, they were all over the place, and I was like, I'm going to do something on these. All right. They had little snails on them, which were like parasites, and I painted the, all the parasites with fingernail polish to see how they moved around. And it took forever. Forever. All right. So back to this. With, with this um, macro evolution, it, can, it, it, it tends to happen uh, over long periods of time. So let's look at the space, okay? Now, evolution can happen at different speeds, okay? There are punctuated equilibrium. That is where it happens very quickly after a long period of being the same. It's usually driven by some colossal environmental change, okay? Example. After the extinction of the dinosaurs, very small, primitive, mouse, rat-like rodents had niches to fill all over the place. So mammals exploded, okay? There's another one in the history of life on Earth called the Cambrian Explosion, okay? New niches opened up, life evolution went crazy, okay? Then there's gradualism. This is where changes in population happen very slowly over huge time span. This is really easy stuff, guys. Gradual, gradualism happens gradually. Punctuated equilibrium is where things stay the same and then boom, some punctuation. Think of a punctuation mark where something ends and another one begins. Now, let's look at some other terms related to this and ideas. We're almost done. In divergent evolution, groups with the same common ancestor evolve and accumulate differences okay so this might be like turtles there are many different species of turtle but they probably all had a few common ancestors but we have many different species adaptive radiation is part of this okay if some new habitat or niche becomes available, the species, this is like, like I said with like uh, uh, the, uh, you know, extinction level event for, for the dinosaurs. 
okay? This can happen very quickly and they can branch out to many different um, species very quickly if new niches open up. Now next, okay? Convergent evolution, remember, if all the roads converge on the sawmill, they all go to the same place, okay? This is where two different species develop similar traits despite having different ancestors. An example of that would be like sharks and dolphins. They have very similar body shapes. And if you go back into the fossil record, there's also Ichthyosaurus, which is like a whole family of fish-shaped dinosaurs. Ichthys means fish, okay? If you're an ichthyologist, you're a fish scientist. Okay. What do they call that little Christianity fish that some people put on the back of it? It's called an ichthys. And we can get analogous traits. So in my example with sharks, dolphins, and ichthyosaurus, they all have very similar traits body plans with very different ancestors. That's because moving through the water turns out to have really well-defined physics and so everything kind of like evolves to solve that problem in the same way. Now there's obvious difference. If you're warm-blooded like marine mammals, you grow a lot of fat to stay warm, but their body shape is generally very, very similar. You get that teardrop shape. They can move through the water very quickly and efficiently, maneuver through the water. We have one more slide, and then we'll take a break, and we'll let you guys get into that individual work. Okay. Four... Our final thought, extinction, okay? A lot of people think of extinction as bad, and it is, but it is something that's naturally happened over the entire course of life on the planet, okay? Um, so not all extinction is caused by humans, okay? A lot of extinction is just, there's change. There was some sort of, disease, something in the environment changed faster than the, the species could deal with it because they just couldn't out-evolve the change, okay? There are five really well-defined extinctions in Earth's history, okay? We are, yes, okay? So, extinction we are living in a time of accelerated extinction, and that's just over the course of human history, okay? And conservation is a relatively new idea. There are people that have gone back and looked at, like, the journals of people who were like, I think I may have shot the last one of these on Earth. <laughs> and, like, just, that was just... A thought at that time but human activity is definitely affecting this and usually larger slower reproduct uh, uh, reproductive time scale animals are way more susceptible so these big megafauna animals tend to go extinct a lot like rhinos lions tigers okay One thing that it does create, if one species goes extinct, it can open up a different niche that can be exploited. So these top level predators, they are very susceptible to this because they have to have huge hunting areas. Um, I just read an article yesterday about um, jaguars being spotted in, 
in, in along the southern border for the first time in a long time. I read one um, also about um, these animals becoming closer to humans because we live everywhere now. And they're just going out and doing what they do. They're hunting animals. Sometimes it's a deer. Sometimes it's your pet dog. Okay? So that creates a big emotional response with people like, those are killing Fluffy. Let's get rid of these. So a lot of these animals face a lot of pressures, but we are, we're really starting to get successful at, at, at sometimes bringing animals that are headed for extinction back to healthy population levels. There's a really controversial way of doing it that you may have seen where let's say it's some sort of animal that people like to hunt okay there are some african deer and things like that that they've brought over to texas and they've brought back to big population sizes does anybody know how they do it they charge very very wealthy people thousands and thousands of dollars to go hunt the animals okay so you kill a few of them in sport hunting but it makes huge amounts of money for you to like rehabilitate the species some people are like as long as we keep the species around that's a really good idea other people aren't as open to that idea and they're kind of like if you're killing them I'd just rather them be extinct that's lot there's lots of ethics in biology lots of ethics in biology all right, going to go ahead and end things here.